Lucia, welcome, welcome. Let me just uh, uh, go here. Did I stop sharing? I did, right? No. Do you want to start sharing your slide, uh, Lucia? Let me just be sure. Uh, Okay, all right. Okay, so um, again, thank you all. Uh, and let's get started. I promised you great information. And one of the main challenges that we have in our field of diabetes is certainly uh, how to classify our patients with diabetes. Is it type one, type two, neither? What's going on? And we all have different types of patients and phenotypes have been really uh, evolving in terms of how we can identify them. This is gonna be fascinating for all of us. So let me just welcome good friend and colleague, Lucia Novak, uh, and let me just briefly introduce her. She is a board certified nurse practitioner in both adult health and advanced diabetes management. She has vast experience, more than 25 years in the field. Uh, she is the president of Diabetes Consulting Services uh, and working with uh, Capital Diabetes and Endocrine Associates. Uh, of Silver Spring in Camp Springs in Maryland. Uh, she has been involved in many different activities with the American Diabetes Association and some of the steering committee, uh, some of the uh, panels. And she's also associate editor for Clinical Diabetes, which is a peer reviewed publication of the American Diabetes Association. Um, also of note, she has worked extensively uh, as a commissioned officer of the United States Army Nurse uh, Corps. So she said, also that uh, part of uh, work in her curriculum, and, and as I said, vast experience in talking about the importance of the team approach. You know, Lucia as a nurse practitioner uh, really sees a lot of patients with diabetes and, and she will walk us today about what I just said about, what is it, what type of diabetes our patients may be having. So Lucia, thank you very much for being with us uh, again and please you can start with your presentation. Thank you, Enrique, and thank all of you for joining me today. I'm so excited to be here. So does your patient have type one or type two diabetes or neither? I will say that we probably need better nomenclature and a classification system. I don't think it is as cut and dry as we would like to think it is. And, um, Along with the social determinants of health, I think that we all have inherent bias when we approach our patients. And sometimes that bias can get in the way of properly diagnosing or rendering care. And I couldn't agree more with Enrique with his previous presentation that um, patients, not typically intentional, non-adherent or non-compliant, there's always something that's getting in the way. If someone intentionally wants to be ill, that's usually a mental health situation that needs to be addressed. Um, most people don't want to be ill. And um, we as clinicians need to figure out how to uh, make them successful and find out what the barriers are. So uh, this is me and Enrique already mentioned all of that. These are my disclosures. And nothing that I'm going to be discussing today is going to be impacted by who I promotionally speak for. So here's our first polling question. In your clinical practice, how often do you come across patients that have that you suspect have been misdiagnosed with having the wrong type of diabetes? Is it never? at least once a week, at least once a month, or at least once a year. I'll give that a few more seconds for everyone to participate. And what I'm seeing is that there are very few of you out there that have never, never come across a person that seemed to be misdiagnosed. And there are many of you that believe you have come across that at least once a year, sometimes more frequently. And I will tell you, I come across it pretty frequently myself. There's always something that makes me go, hmm. And we're gonna talk about those things that make us go, hmm, 
So like I said, the vast majority of you have run across this in your practice at least once in um, the last year. And so let's talk about where we are. Okay, polling question number two. Um, if you have encountered poorly, um, if you have encountered patients that made you suspicious, what was the issue? Was it no matter what you did, their diabetes remained poorly managed? Or the patient did not respond to medications as you would have expected? Or they had other comorbidities that did not match the type of diabetes they were diagnosed with? There were other lab results that made you question whether or not they had type one or type two, or something in their family medical history made you question um, what was going on. And I'm looking at the responses as they come in and Basically, it's things just aren't making sense. Either they're not responding to medications, um, no matter what you try to do with medications and lifestyle, you can't seem to get a handle on their diabetes, um, or you have seen other things in their labs that made you question um, the accuracy of the results. Okay, so let's move on. So our learning objectives is that by the end of this session, you should be able to explain the importance of the correct classification of diabetes when diagnosing patients with diabetes. It is important to know what exactly we're dealing with. I, I tell my patients, we need to understand and name the monster so that we know how to deal with that monster. Discern the clinical findings that may raise your suspicion for whether or not a patient has been accurately diagnosed with type one or type two, and what are some laboratory tests that you can use that will help you to determine which classification of diabetes to consider. Sorry about that. Why is clarity important? So as Mark Twain said in his book, Following the Equator, A Journey Around the World, Names are not always what they seem. And I think that's really important because without knowing what you're dealing with, how do you then therefore guide appropriate treatment? We treat people with type one diabetes very differently than we treat people who have type two. Um, we also need to know what comorbids patients may expect to have. So if they have an autoimmune disorder, we have to be on the alert for other autoimmune disorders and we need to screen appropriately. If it's not an autoimmune disorder, but we know that there's a buy one, get three free that we typically see with type two diabetes, especially in the realm of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we need to be screening differently for those patients. Even in the microvascular realm of complications, we know that people with type two have kind of been living in a soup of hyperglycemia for many, many years before they actually get diagnosed with type two diabetes. So they typically will present with at least one microvascular complication. And so we need to be screening them upon diagnosis Whereas people with autoimmune type one, they're not brewing in that situation. And so they tend to not present with complications, but we still need to know when we need to start screening for those patients. And so knowing what we're dealing with actually is very, very important. So we kind of see the trees and we recognize that type one is an autoimmune destruction of the beta cells, rendering them unable to secrete insulin at all. And so it is an absolute insulin um, 
inability to secrete insulin at all, which places them at great risk for diabetic ketoacidosis. We know that there are autoimmune antibodies, so autoantibodies that we can be looking for, the GAD65, IA2s, um, the zinc transporter 8s, and the insulin autoantibodies. We typically know that autoimmune disorders affect children and adolescents more so than the uh, older population. They tend to be lean, they tend to be Caucasian. All right, and what do we know about type two? We know that type two is typically more insulin resistance, which eventually could lead to deficiency. They tend to be older, typically over the age of 45. The newer guidelines are now recommending that we screen at the age of 35 and older for type two diabetes. We know that they also typically have a comorbid overweight or obesity where that excess um, adipose tissue is in the visceral adiposity and so contributing to that insulin resistance and the uh, dyslipidemia and hypertension that we also see affecting our patients. Um, we call that metabolic syndrome when they haven't quite um, gotten hyperglycemia to the degree where we would classify it as being diabetes, but we see um, elevated glucoses in the abnormal range and low HDLs and high triglycerides. They typically have hypertension and all of this puts them at high risk for atherosclerotic disease. We typically see this in the non-Caucasian populations. And while they may not require insulin to live as the counterparts of people with autoimmune disorders will need that insulin to survive. Uh, people with type two will need it as a form of treatment um, oftentimes. So we see the trees, but are we missing the forest as a result? There are many different subtypes of type two diabetes and it can be determined by race or ethnicity. We're gonna talk about some of these, um, the Modi's, the Lada's, that's not a cup of coffee, KPD, that's not a fraternity, ketosis prone diabetes. We actually know that approximately 10% of all adults that have type two diabetes actually have Lada, which stands for latent autoimmune diabetes of the adult, which is essentially type one diabetes. And age is just a number. I just mentioned that we changed when we actually start screening people for type two diabetes. It used to be over the age of 45, regardless of what your risk factors are. Well, now it's at the age of 35 that we start screening. And 42% of people with type one, even though I said it typically occurs younger, 42% of them are over the age of 30. Okay, and we're also seeing type two in a younger population. In fact, a third of all new diagnosis of diabetes in children is actually type two. And the differences between the United States and our European partners is rather um, concerning. 12 per 100,000 in the US versus 2.5 per 100,000 in Europe. And there's a 7% increase in the disease of type 2 diabetes in this younger population every year. But we also see that our type 1s, autoimmune disorders, seem to be on the rise as well with a 2% increase. And where I said that predominantly we typically see autoimmune disorders in the Caucasian population, we're actually seeing a much more significant rise in our minority ethnicities. Black, Hispanic, Asian Pacific are rising tremendously compared to the Caucasian population and obesity is prevalent and it's making it very difficult to discern does a patient have type one or do they have type two? Because when we see a patient that has the disease of overweight or obesity, it kind of skews where we start digging for um, understanding what's actually uh, happening as far as is it insulin resistance or do they actually have type one? And we're seeing that 42% of adults in 2020 had obesity. That's a BMI of 30 and higher. And that's a 26% increase from just 2008. And when we look at our adolescents and children, we're seeing almost 20% 
in that age group of two to 19 in, in 2020, and where it was only 5% in the mid 1970s. So obesity is prevalent and it's contributing to insulin resistance, whether a patient has type one or type two. So I mentioned things that make you go, hmm. So DKA at diagnosis, but eventually no need for insulin and never again having diabetic ketoacidosis. So we know that DKA diagnosis usually signals type one diabetes, but type ones need insulin to survive. So what's going on there? How about someone who is determined to be type two, you put them on a low dose of sulfonylurea, hopefully that's kind of going by the wayside now that we have better medications out there that don't cause hypoglycemia, but they're having hypoglycemia with low doses of these insulin secretagogues. But when you switch them to something that would better address insulin resistance, they don't seem to have any improvement in their blood sugars. So what's going on there? How about someone who's diagnosed as having type one diabetes under the age of 18 months? That's not typically type one diabetes. And I believe we're gonna be hearing more about that. And long, and I do mean long remission uh, for phase one, we call that the honeymoon phase. And yes, you can look in the literature and see that the honeymoon phase for type one diabetes can run the gamut of anywhere from a few weeks to several years. But typically we see the honeymoon phase start to wane after about a year. Um, that's typically what we see in clinical practice. And so patients that um, don't require insulin for much longer than that makes you go, hmm, significant hyper or hypoglycemia that does not match the treatment. So we have to think of the mechanism of action of the medications that we're using, and they will work if the mechanism of action addresses the underlying pathology. So again, when you have patients on multiple agents and they just don't seem to be getting any better, and then the presence of other medical problems. Do they have other autoimmune disorders, hypothyroid Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, rheumatoid arthritis, pernicious anemia, vitiligo? Those are some of the common ones that we see. Celiac. How about comorbid hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or steatic hepati hep um, hepatitis with uh, liver disease? Um, do they have sleep apnea? These are all signs that it might be an insulin resistance. Acanthosis nigricans, how it looks differently in different shades of beige and brown and black. Are we missing these subtle signs? So what is the diagnostic test for, di for differentiating between type one and type two diabetes? Is it one, a C-peptide level? Is it two, the presence or absence of islet cell antibodies? Is it three, insulin, triglycerides, and HDL levels? Or four, there is no one test that accurately differentiates between type one and type two. And I will say the vast majority of you are out there understand that there really is no one test that differentiates between type one and type two. And it's going to take um, an investigative mind and probably a combination of all of these things to help put you on the right path. Okay, so let's figure out how to get in that right direction. So C-peptide, and I caution you, when you order a C-peptide, please get it with a glucose value because that C-peptide really doesn't mean much if we don't know what the glucose is. So if the glucose is in the 80s, I wouldn't expect to see an elevated glucose uh, or an elevated C-peptide. If their glucoses are really high and they've been running in the two, three hundreds for a while, they may actually have glucose toxicity. And despite having an elevated glucose, their C-peptide could be um, non-detectable. So again, it's gonna depend on whether or not a C-peptide is gonna tell you if a patient has type one or type two. Well, what about the presence of antibodies? Yes, 
More often, we see autoantibodies in people with type 1 diabetes because type 1 should be autoimmune hyperglycemia diabetes. But we also see presence of antibodies in people with ketosis prone diabetes. And we only currently are testing the GAD, the zinc, the IA2s and the insulin autoantibodies. Are there others out there that we are missing? It wasn't that long ago that the zinc T um, transporter eight was more of a research type of an autoantibody. And it only recently became part of clinical practice for us to use. Um, 15 fold increased risk of type one diabetes in people that have a first or second degree relative. However, 80% of people with type one diabetes have no family history. And the absence of antibodies does not equal type two diabetes. We know that autoantibodies can wane with time. GAD will be your most um, prevalent and the, the most long duration of an antibody. So I do recommend you include those, but not having an antibody doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have um, type one diabetes. And then what about elevated fasting insulin? Typically, if we see elevated fasting insulin, that means type two. So when you get, if you're ordering L, um, fasting insulin levels in your patients with glucose, okay, um, true normal is less than 10. Although the parameter in the lab result will say as, as high as less than 25 is considered the normal range you should never see a patient with a fasting insulin above 10. If you're seeing it above 10, that's telling you they do indeed have some insulin resistance. And lipids are indeed a clue. Elevated triglycerides, low HDL are typically signs of insulin resistance and those should make you question the actual diagnosis. So it's a clustering of these things. There is no one test. And the more information you have, the better off you are. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I will be back to go over some cases and to help you put what we just talked about into practice, but I'm gonna turn it over now to Miriam, my